This morning, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is in jail awaiting sentence. A jury convicted him on all three counts of murder and manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. Chauvin's bond was revoked and he was handcuffed and ushered out of the courtroom after the verdict was read. The maximum sentence he could face 40 years for second degree murder, 25 years for third degree murder and 10 years for second degree manslaughter. But that doesn't mean he will serve a total of 75 years in prison, which that adds up to. Niners legal expert uh, Whitney Trailer, MSU professor, is here to break down what we can expect in the sentencing. Whitney, good morning. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, everyone. First, uh, why don't you talk about the sentencing options that uh, that he may face? Sure. Gary, you listed it correctly. It was on the three charges anywhere from 40 to 10 years. Now, those charges or those sentences will run uh, together. So the most he is looking at really is 40 years. Now, there is a presumptive sentencing guideline of 12.5 years in Minnesota for a first-time offender, which Derek Chauvin is. So that is sort of the presumptive number. Now, what's happening now over the next eight weeks is that the lawyers are going to be briefing the judge and making arguments to the judge regarding aggravating circumstances. So the prosecution is going to say, hey, there were ag aggravating circumstances, including uh, a child witnessing it, an abuse of power, uh, George Floyd being in a, a, a position of weakness or vulnerability. And those things could actually enhance the number of years that Chauvin gets. So that will be the argument. And ultimately, that will be up to the judge to decide in eight weeks. All right, very good. So now this has been all over social media, this discussion. Monday, the judge uh, expressed some frustration at Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California for telling protesters to stay in the streets if the verdict was anything but guilty. So Chauvin's attorney claimed that her comments were grounds for mistrial. The judge denied that, but he did mention that it could give them something to file an appeal on. So my question to you, how likely is it that that could really make a difference? Well, it will certainly be a basis for an appeal. Uh, the, the judge denied the motion to dismiss, as you mentioned, but said, hey, this could be, and said this on the record, this could be a basis for an appeal to reverse the whole thing. Now, the question is, uh, did Maxine Waters' comment get to the jury? Did it influence the jury? And I don't think it did. I mean, the, the jury knew the gravity of this situation. I mean, if they were living in America, they understood the circumstances under which this case was being presented. So I, I, I do believe that will be a basis for an appeal. I highly doubt that it will have any impact or reverse the, uh, the outcome that we saw yesterday. Taking a, a bigger look at the impact of this verdict, so is this, do you think this is a precedent? Where do you think we go from here? Oh boy, well, it's interesting. I mean, I think the starting place is the reaction that we saw yesterday, including in myself. I mean, it was this complete sigh of relief. And I think that's notable because as a legal analyst, as a lawyer, I watched the trial and the evidence was overwhelming. And so essentially the system worked the way it was supposed to. And I just think it's notable that there's such excitement and such, there was such a question of whether or not it would be a, a guilty or not guilty verdict. And I think this just really illuminates some of the issues that we have in this country around race. And to me, I think it really highlighted this fear, this fear that they're uh, uh, particularly around black men. I mean, they talked about uh, he had super, you know, George Floyd had superhuman strength and how how big he was. And they even said those things about Elijah McClain, who's only 140 pounds. And I think these sort of stereotypes and narratives uh, have come come into play. And these the, the fear that we're seeing both from the police and society at large, I think, is really contributing to this divide that we're seeing. And and we are completely polarized, but I, I'm hopeful that this is a step in the right direction and that these conversations really lead us to a place of contact. I mean, I think the only way we move forward is together. And the only way we do that together is if we actually have contact. The, the folks who have these fears towards black men, I would almost say, who do you have in your personal life? And do, uh, you know, do the people, the black men that you know in your personal life reflect 
the fears that you have. And so I'm just hopeful that we can uh, lower the temperature and hopefully start to move forward together because that's the only way we're going to get out of this thing. Yep, well put, and uh, we hope so too. Whitney Trailer, as always, thank you. Appreciate it.